Okay, now it's picking up on something. Okay, boom. Okay. All right. Damn it. Why is it? Okay. Can people hear that? Okay. Oh, good. Jesus Christ. Oh, okay. Does that sound like that's the right audio? Is it this microphone? Hopefully. Let me see. Yeah, it looks like it's actually that. Okay. Jesus Christ, you guys. I can't believe you guys stayed here for that long. I was about to give up on me, so why wouldn't you give up on me as well? Oh, Lord. Oh, thank you so much, everyone, for being so encouraging because I am um, I am emotionally depleted. I have no tenacity or grit or any of those psychologically prized qualities um, that you're supposed to have to be a success. Um, oh, God, it is a metaphor. It is a metaphor, Gwyneth B., for um, what writing is like, um, especially trying to get published, which... You know, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, <laughs> I came here for community and seriously, just watching you keep going helped me already. Oh, thank you, CNJHC. Um, that's definitely a, a nice and, and very kind uh, frame to put on it. <laughs> so I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> yes, chubby kumquat. I have like no tenacity. I have like no grit. Anytime I've faced any kind of setback of any kind, I've wanted to just completely give up um, and and rage at the universe. Um, and now I'm in the even worse situation of realizing that throwing money at this problem will help fix it by buying more hardware. And that's terrible. <laughs> that's awful. I don't like that at all, but again, quite a metaphor. All right. <laughs> How is everybody else uh, doing today? Um, I saw that Callisto is on their work break. <coughs> Devin, we can make you a gaming PC. Oh, here's the other thing. I can't, I need something I can move around. Like, so I, and I know laptops just don't hit the same, don't, they just don't shit the same, so that's kind of a problem oh it hurts it fucking hurts out here uh is everybody else uh struggling today oh okay. wow the viewer count just jumped a bunch because things are actually working so that's that's good i'm not on a work break so i'll need to drop off soon yeah dog <laughs> yes yeah, definitely struggling today yep Oh, well, I'm glad we're all united in um, life-sucking dick and balls and all today um, and, and every day. It's very gray out. I put the ring light on. This whole month is a struggle. Yeah, I feel that. Oh, God. Well, yeah, it's been hard times lately. Yeah. Oh, oh thank you for joining from Norway. Fuck December. First week back at work after the flu slash mono. Oh, my God. Oh, please, please take it easy, B. Bailey B. Mono is so brutal. Um, I know um, Sky of Rebirth Garments, um, who some of you are familiar with or you might have read about in Unmasking Autism. Um, they've been dealing with mono for the last, like, like two years, two, three years now. And um, it's just had a really dramatic impact on how many garments they can make and what they can do. So um, they they have really bad flare ups with that kind of stuff, um, and sometimes just can't can't be sewing or anything. I started reading la reading laziness does not exist as some medicine for treating my guilt for being so tired. Tired. It's really hard. Um, even just myself um, and going back to the writing piece when I have a little bit of like brain fog or just can't really focus on the writing or can't think of what to do to move things forward next, I think or like I have these panic spirals of like, Oh, I'm never going to write again. I've lost my capacity. I'm, you know, inept. I, like all of these things that one would hope I would get past. Um, and some, you know, with physical health, I've gotten a little bit more tolerant of those things, but I don't know. It's very easy to get swept up in worrying about, you know, in a very real way, how am I going to just survive and pay the rent? But then on some other um, existential level, just who am I if I'm not 
producing things, if I'm not making things, um, or if I'm not sharp today, even though none of us are. And all of us will become less sharp with time. And that's like a luckier outcome than a lot of other outcomes. So, yeah. Oh. Oh my gosh. Uh, Rainmon, I'm sorry, Nightbot. Uh, muted you. I did not mean for it to do that. I'm still uh, figuring that out as well. I was trying to put in links to our socials and a little tip jar via Nightbot, but um, that's not working either. Um, so that's another another thing I'm going to have to work on. But okay. Oh, 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 Rainmont, you don't need to, you're not in trouble at all. I'm, I just installed that bot and it came with some preloaded settings. Um, and telling people not to spam the chat might be something that you need to do when you have like hundreds of people here, but I like, I like people putting things in. So, um, so maybe I can remove Nightbot as a mod for now because I don't want people getting, you know, in trouble for just interacting it anyway. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, let me just copy the link to the Twitch stream and post it on on Tumblr. Okay. So, as if you're here, you're probably aware that this is my um, four-year anniversary of being an agent and author, so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about a little bit here. Um, oh, I, Bambi said, I have an identity crisis, um, accepting that I'm allowed to be a creative rather than an academic. The brain function makes it hard for me to allow myself to let go of expectations. Have you experienced this? Um, this, is, this is a good... Um, a good thing to kind of pivot into kind of talking about writing and creativity um, as someone who was trained in the academy to, you know, express myself in a particular way and to really only aspire to certain kinds of creative work. And I don't know if, um, if everyone in uh, social psychology would even value, you know, calling their work creative at all, right? Um, because some of them want to be taken seriously as rigorous scientists or whatever. Um, I personally, um, with academia, was so starved for a creative outlet and so starved for writing that was of any quality, um, that was accessible, that was pleasant or enjoyable to read, or even that was clear, that um, for me, running headlong into writing short stories, which is really how I started, to then writing essays and books for a wide audience that was very much decidedly not academic work. That was really um, very self-motivating for me. I already had kind of come through graduate school for a few years when I started writing. Um, I was kind of finishing up my master's degree, and I just knew I could just tell that like academic writing was just bad communication it was passively voiced and I have an article coming out about that um, soon it was you know slow and indirect and vague they would just come up with words that made no sense you know um, I think David Foster Wallace made some joke about this like you just put self and then hyphen in front of every fucking word uh, in academia, especially psychology, so you end up with bizarre concepts like self-empathy, which that's just called having emotions, <laughs> like self-empathy, like what? Feeling your own feelings? That's like, it's so redundant, <laughs> but you know. And yes, um, academic writing is so formulaic. History PhD from the UK and we capturing your own voice after years of academia is still super hard. Yes. And um, that's something, that was a book that I was going to recommend on this stream and I was going to show it, though I think switching scenes is going to make my computer explode, unfortunately. Um, it's a book called How to Write a Lot by Paul Sylvia. I'll put that in the chat because it is just a really incredible book about finding your own voice 
um, specifically as an academic, but I recommend this book to everyone um, that I know that wants to be on a more consistent creative schedule, not just um, academics or people trying to write journal articles. Um, my lack of experience, my experience and lack of uh, qualifications made people think what I have to say is redundant. That's another thing, um, and we can get into this in the conversation of um, of writer's block. I think a lot of times what people experience as writer's block is um, they are filtering out any ideas they do have. It's not that they have a lack of ideas. It's that um, people are dismissing, when they're suffering from writer's block, every single creative idea that they have, saying, you know, other people have said this before, I'm not the one to tell this story. I'm not qualified. I haven't read enough yet to write this article. I haven't done enough research. Um, what I'm, you, you know, I might have the idea in my head, but the way that I'm expressing it on the page isn't making sense. Da 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 da. Um, and it's all of those filters, all of those just reflexive um, stoppings of our own creativity that we experience as having no ideas. When really we have a ton of ideas, we're just dismissing all of them as not good enough, or if they are a good idea, that we're not executing them correctly. Uh, Gwyneth B. asked, do you go through nonverbal phases where it's coming from an autistic overwhelm kind of place? I definitely um, do. Um, I, I never really go nonverbal in the sense of um, not processing things with words. Um, I'm very, you know, hyperlexic. Um, to use that kind of uh, framework of autism, like language is the way that I experience the world, but verbalizing it um, isn't always easy. It takes a lot of energy. Um, and this is something that Philosophy Tube has talked about. American English accents require a lot of breath, even compared to like British English, compared to lots of other dialects of English. Um, the kind of standard, you know, mid Atlantic and Midwestern. Um, English accent is really exhausting. English is a really exhausting language to produce, especially with that accent. Um, so I get exhausted from speaking physically pretty easily, um, especially um, in loud environments where I have to project. Um, and, and then, of course, the aforementioned brain fog, which is, I think, what some people are getting at in the chat, like Bambi with them. Sometimes it's hard to get it out in the right way. Um, and I find that, um, I only have like three, three ish good writing hours in me at once. And I can try to push past that. And I often do. And, uh, I have to learn the same lesson over and over again that, um, you can only do that kind of focus for so long. It's almost like I wrote a book about it and didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't take my own advice. It's like, cause you know, that pressure to just get this thing done, um, and that thinking of, well, I was able to do it an hour ago. Why can't I continue doing it now? Is just so tempting. But um, going back to the conversation of um, getting into writing after being really scarred by academia, academia really grinds you up and chews you out. The whole process um, of kind of just submitting to the judgment of a committee and an advisor is such that um, a lot of people walk away from academia having no um, confidence in themselves because it is an apprenticeship model where your entire career hinges on the approval of one person who you also work for and usually provide very poorly compensated labor for. And, um, and the way that people prove that they even deserve to be there in academia is by being really brutal and rigorous in the critiques that they subject other people to. So uh, there's just a culture of finding fault, of proving that you deserve to be there by always being able to find fault in other people's work. And um, when people are reviewing others' work, they usually come to it with, how would I have done it? If, I, if this were my project, how would I do it? Rather than asking, um, was this work a success from the creator's point of view? Did the person do what they set out to do? Did they test the hypothesis that they set out to test? Did they, you know, create the artistic work that they set out to create? And that's really, I think, how we often should be evaluating those things as mentors and advisors. 
But anyway, yeah. Um, so I wanted to do this stream because I just got a little, you know, Instagram memories reminder, which is something they've just added, um, reminding me that I've had an agent now for four years. It was uh, December 14th of, um, of 2018 uh, that I got my agent. Um, and that really put me on the path of thinking for the very first time about translating my writing into something longer than an essay and into a book. That is something I had not been thinking about. I didn't have um, the kind of drive <laughs> to kind of consistently put energy into a long-term project like that. Um, and I had no idea. Um, and I knew people who had published books, but all that I knew about that process was that it is years long and that I don't have the patience for things like that. And I usually want um, instant gratification, especially if I'm really passionate about an idea that I have. So I had been writing online purely as um, kind of therapy from academia. You know, when you're writing a journal article, it's really slow going. You're writing that's the average person. Um, so I had started writing online on Tumblr, which is how I met Sigurd Stark and um, maybe some other people who are here um, and just throw it out into the world. Um, and I'm from doing that for over the course of years, um, I eventually got into the point where, um, you know, I had built up a little bit of an audience and I had written some essays that were a success, but I had never thought about taking that any further and making that into a book because that seemed like just returning to academia and all of its slow, grueling uh, processes and and uh, just, you know, the, publishing is notoriously a very old um, and very slow um world where it takes years for them to kind of absorb an idea and reflect it back at all. Um, so I thought kind of to, um, to kind of mark this turning point in my career where suddenly I had somebody reach out to me, a literary agent who said, Hey, this essay that you've written, laziness does not exist. It has, it, it really cleanly touches on some really important themes and it clearly has a whole book lurking inside of it. How are we going to go and turn this thing into, um, you know, or are you interested is basically what this prospective agent asked me. Are you interested in turning uh, this essay into a book? And I got on the phone with her and I vetted, you know, whether or not she was a real person and she was, uh, and her agency was real and she had been involved in the success of a bunch of different authors, including like Elena Ferrante and all of these other people. And so, you know, I, and she was also an Ohioan who had, uh, who was a philosophy student um, and had an advanced degree in philosophy, but had left academia to work on publishing for a wide audience. So it was like, oh, this is perfect. Let's actually work on a project together. Uh, Bambi Girl says, social media and sharing my ideas online is an outlet for me, but I want it to go somewhere. And that, that's the struggle, you know, um, the instant gratification, um, the lure of social media, it just tricks us into trading us, our best ideas for, com for completely free while they make a profit off of it. And I suffer from that so much as well. Um, Gwyneth B. asked, when did you start with Medium? And do you feel like it's genuinely a good place for folks who want to get paid for shorter form writing? Yes. Yeah, let's dive into that. So just to give you a quick sense of the timeline, and I had sl I had PowerPoint slides, I had all kinds of things, but I feel like if I try to switch to it, it's um, Twitch Studio is going to crash on me, so I'll just verbalize it for now. Um, but I, um, I got a Tumblr in 2011, 2012, when I was finishing up my master's degree, um, and... I just kind of wrote whatever I felt like on there. This was back when Tumblr had a whole writing community, and Eric and I, Six Word Story and I, have done a panel um, at AWP about this, along with other Tumblr writers. Um, there was a big, robust writing community on Tumblr back then, um, and I would write short stories, I would serialize them, and I would also write weird little rants and essays, and if I saw people making claims about psychology that were not accurate, I would go in there and be, write little rants about how, you know, no, we, do, we don't use only 10% of our brains. We use a lot more than that, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and some of those things caught on and I, and I was writing just all the time. Um, and, oh, Nightbot, you're struggling so hard. From robust to just bust to, to just us. <laughs> um, and then Medium came along. You know, Medium had been around for significantly longer, but I got started in 2017 posting over there. And that was around the time that, um, that, that Tumblr was really kind of starting to fall in the toilet. Um, it used to have an edited prose tag where you could feature. I was a prose tag editor a completely unpaid position that uh, Tumblr just made me. Specific advice for someone who's not looking for instant for gratification, has a modest following already, and definitely has a book inside, for which I'm pretty sure there's an audience. Okay, we will get to exactly that kind of um, ambition in a second here, because I, I that is something, you are like the target audience for this kind of conversation. Um, so, I... Um, because Tumblr's writing community was dying, they got rid of their edited prose tag. Their membership was kind of dwindling. Um, this was before the porn ban, but it was coming up on, or wait, it was coming up on, on the porn ban era. Um, and so the site was just kind of crumbling apart and it had changed hands a couple of times. And so I thought, well, a lot of us thought it was going to die. And I had everything backed up on a WordPress, but I wanted to find someplace else to host my writing. And Medium was the thing at the time. Medium in 2017 was very similar to um, Substack today. Um, it had, you know, was a writing platform that a few big names had used, or that um, you know people would see a particularly popular or viral article or an apology for a call out or whatever would be really popular on medium. Um, and so it was kind of like a, a site that would people were in the back of their minds aware of, um, but it wasn't what it was going to be. wasn't really fully formed in people's minds yet. Um, what do you think about serial fiction? I've been posting to Kindle Vela. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what people are using for that right now. I used to just serialize uh, whole novels on Tumblr, and then I would sell them as Kindle books, and they're still uh, up there on the on the Kindle store under my old name. Um, but I but they've changed the market on that so much, um, and in the last few years, I just haven't been writing fiction consistently like that. Um, so I don't know what people are using. Um, so anyway, I started posting a lot of my um, con my old pieces. I would kind of clean them up so they would look a little bit fancier on Medium, and I'd cross-post them there. And then some of them started really catching on. Old, you know, Tumblr rants that had, like, you know, 20 notes would suddenly have, like, thousands of people reading them on Medium. Um, and so I was like, okay, I need to – I there's something going on here, um, and it just looks more polished. So I started just kind of putting, instead of ranting on social media about something, if something made me upset, I would rant about it on Medium, and I would put the time, a couple of hours, into writing an essay with sources um, and links and images, you know, um, the way that Jesse Meadows does. Now I used to make my own images for my, um, my posts instead of using stock photos, though I don't have their visual acumen so it was like janky ms paint kind of shit like my whole aesthetic usually is um and i wrote um a piece defending trigger warnings and that got spread really far and wide and i got asked to be on chicago tonight and um, i wrote some pieces about kind of pronouns and and um how to measure gender in scientific studies and that got me on npr and like so you know my medium pieces were getting taken seriously and they were getting more traction and then medium started offering me um money in exchange for how shared or or liked or clapped for each medium uh, post was and that kind of started around you know 2017 2018 um, like late 2017 or into early 2018 and for a few years there it was really great um in March of 2018, I wrote Laziness Does Not Exist, the essay, and that blew up purely of its own accord. You know, that's that lightning in a bottle moment. I had been blogging and writing online since I was a kid um, almost every week. A lot of it was just kind of social media rants and ephemera, but um, over the years, I had gotten more and more intentional with it and more and more polished with it. Um, and then, you know, after 15 years of doing that, roughly uh something caught on 
completely on its own. Um, and I wrote Laziness Does Not Exist in one sitting at my friend Jess White's house. We used to have these little writing groups once a week on Sundays where I would go to their house and we would eat snacks and other friends would come over and we'd work on writing projects. And, and you know, a friend of ours who was a composer would come and, and compose music on like sheet music too. Um, and one day I was just really feeling angry about how underestimated a lot of my students are, um, especially at this evangelical college where I used to teach. Um, and so I just wrote this big, you know, defense of all of the working and tired and depressed and traumatized students who get written off as lazy. Um, and it was something that had been percolating in the back of my mind for years, but the idea was ready at that time. Um, and it just came out of me. And, um, you know, within a couple of days, it was, it was everywhere. Um, and I was getting emails from people about it every single day for over a year, um, and because Medium back then, their algorithm, their payment um, algorithm was so generous and so based on just like how many reads does this piece have, um, laziness was making me, you know, hundreds, hundreds to thousands of dollars um, a month for like a year. Um, it was wild. Um and it was getting shared just, you know, like the numbers were just like climbing and climbing and, and it hit like 2 million reads by the end of that year. So laziness came out in March of 2018, December of 2018. I get this email from my agent who is now the person who would become my agent, um, just saying, sorry for, you know, barging into your inbox. Um, laziness does not exist. It's fantastic. It's really effective at making its its argument, have you ever thought about turning that into a book? Um, and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I guess I probably should. Um, that sounds like a lot of work, and it sounds like it sucks, but um, there's definitely more to be said here. And so, as I already mentioned, I vetted the agent. We had a good phone call. She had ideas for how to turn it into a book. She sent me an example book proposal, and then I started writing it. Um, and then we sold the book by summer of 2019. I wrote it fall of 2019 um, and then edited it all through 2020. And it came out uh, in January of 2021. Wait, no. Yes, January 2021. Yeah, that's right. Um, so that's kind of how, that was kind of my journey with media. And throughout, you know, 2018, that was like the golden time with medium where you could make money <laughs> okay but we should recreate that writing club and call it the vivant society <laughs> well well the person whose house it was is definitely on adhd meds i don't think they're on vivants <laughs> as i as i think it's pronounced <laughs> and cat marnell agrees so um so that's the fancy you know New York elite, which I'm not, but uh, pretend to be in my in my fantasy, in my most evil fantasies. So to answer your question about medium, medium for a few years there, it was paying writers really well. If your piece got a lot of attention, you would get a lot of payment commensurate to that. Uh, long live the schwa. Thank you, Raymond. <laughs> Schwa's over everything. And... Um, Oh, thanks for the follow, Locally Feared. Thanks for being here. And um, Medium also had publications, so and their editors would curate and promote things. So if you had a piece on mental health that was really high caliber, you would get attention. Um, thank you for the following. The Bicelark. Bicelark. The Bicelark. Thank you for being here. Um, and so... Um, so your work would be kind of promoted up the chain. So if you had a science or a tech piece, it would be promoted by some of their science editors or by some of their science mags. Yeah, I know the, the, uh, the sound effect is really loud, uh, but if you think I'm going to be able to fix that with the bucket of bolts that I'm riding in right now, <laughs> this laptop, which I stole from my work, is the fucking Millennium Falcon, Falcon and it's falling apart, <laughs> and my life is falling apart. <laughs> But uh, but apologies to all of my sensory sensitive um, everyone's here who are being disturbed. 
I will wait to follow until after this ends, says Cassie. <laughs> oh, no. This is what happens when a bunch of autistic people get on Twitch. I w I'll fix that. I will fix that. Um, but there's a lot of things I got to fix first, such as my life. Um, unfortunately, though, Medium really kind of fell off. They fired a lot of their editors. They got rid of a lot of their curated uh, publications. Their payment structure changed. <laughs> okay, everyone, follow now. It's the power hour. Oh, God. Um, and so now, you know, I, as someone with like 46,000 followers on Medium, um, and they now have a system where you get a little bit of a bonus anytime someone um, subscribes to you via email if they're a paid member um, or if they decide to get a Medium subscription after having read your work. You get a little bonus for that stuff. Um, so that's that adds up to, like I think, like under $200 a month. Um, and then I still do get money for every read, which still, again, comes to, you know, it can be hundreds if it's a good month and something gets a lot of shares. Um, and, and yeah, and, but other people like Eric says, um, when you're first starting out, you're looking at a few cents per read. Um, I mean, that's always the case, but it doesn't quite, you know, add up unless you get a lot of reads. Substack, Substack is, you know, a different model. I prefer medium for re and I've kind of gone into this stuff before. The great thing about medium, I, I think is that it's, it, looks more like a publication still, even though they don't have their magazines as much. It gets shared in a different way. People don't really share substacks the way they would share an article or an essay in a publication. It is very personality-driven substack, where you are subscribing to specific personalities and you're giving money only to those specific personalities, which means if you're following multiple people on substack at $5 a month, that adds up really quickly and there's only going to be so many writers that you're going to support. And most people can't and won't um, throw that, you know, five bucks in a month for anyone. And I sure can't blame them for that because that's like buying a bunch of cable stations. It's like, you know, you're supporting a creator directly, which is wonderful, but a lot of people just don't have the money to do that kind of thing. And, um, you know, you can only pay for so much entertainment in your life um, and art and literature. So, um, the flip side with Medium is that people pay $5 a month to unlock access to everything on Medium. If you don't have a membership, you can still read things on Medium for free. You get three free reads a month, or you can just endlessly open up links in an incognito tab on your browser and then read it for free without paying ever, which I highly recommend if you're not paying for a membership. And if you do pay for a membership on Medium, uh, your $5 goes toward whoever you're reading and everyone that you're reading, um, proportionate to who you're reading and clapping for the most. Um, chubby Kumquat. I don't, um, I think on Substack, Substack, you can go as low as you want, um, but $5 is definitely the standard on there. Um, and I just really don't feel comfortable paywalling anything that I write in a way that it's just inaccessible to someone if they don't pay. My work on Medium, I only post two things a month for a couple of reasons, but one of the advantages of, of two a month is that if you're not paying, if you don't know how to get past the paywall, you can still read my stuff um, and you're not going to be unable to access it. And since you can get past the paywall, by just opening medium links in an incognito tab or switching browsers or switching devices, you can just keep doing that and reading as many medium articles as you want with no limit whatsoever. Um, and that's really important to me. I want my work to be able to be read really widely. I want people to be able to access it if they think it's going to be helpful to them. And I want them to be able to share it um, and for it to feel normal to share it, which is just not something that happens with Substack to the same degree. Um, even really successful writers like Danny Lavery, you look at his sub stacks and like a really banger piece will have like 20 likes. It's like, fuck, <laughs> you know, um, and he gets he gets paid a salary by Substack. You know, Substack pays Danny Lavery um, two hundred thousand dollars a year to write a piece a week. Um, and this is public knowledge. Like he was very open about that. 
This advice is not brought to you by medium.com. Yeah. So, you know, get past the paywall, scam it. You know, I'm all about stealing. Um, I'm all about uh, intellectual property theft. And on Medium, it's really easy to do. And my books are really easy to steal, too. If you don't want to buy my books, if you can't buy my books, just go to LibGen and you can read them for free. Um, and, and you know, there's there's PDFs, there's eBooks. The audiobook's a little bit harder to pirate, but um, there are places to pirate the audiobook as well. That's just something that's, you know, important to me. And there's limits on with books how much I can openly advertise it, but I haven't gotten yelled at yet. So that's fantastic. Uh, LibGen just got sued, I think. Um, I think uh, I think you're thinking about the other one that got taken down from TikTok, right? But um, suffice to say, I stole a book off of LibGen this week. Um, I was reading uh, the book Leash by Jane Dellen. Um, I was thinking about having some kind of uh, book roundup next week on the stream, though I'm going to have to solve these tech issues um, before I do anything like that. Um, but I knew I wanted to read it in an ebook format, uh, and so I just hopped on LibGen and I fucking stole that thing. So they lost the lawsuit, but the courts determined they didn't owe the pub companies money. That's good because that would just not be possible <laughs> on any scale at all. And yes, I would love to have Twitch book club book clubs. Um, Danica XIX on here does book clubs uh, where she'll read through usually kind of nerd high fantasy shit like like Dune. Though she's also read you know like the Forty Eight Laws of Power. Her audience is all like dudes who uh, buy her uh, naked calendars. So she does book clubs surrounding uh, books that those kind of dudes would like. Which God fucking bless it. <laughs> I only why would I only want to read books by people I want to financially support yeah exactly um I read Jesse Single's book The Quick Fix and speaking of Substack he's someone who has attacked me on Substack and sent his uh followers of you know just asking questions transphobes after me and uh he's someone who's done a lot of damage to trans people his articles um have been used by uh, anti-trans lawmakers to justify legislation legislation restricting uh, youth transition care. But he wrote a whole book about flawed social psychology studies and replicate, which is the failure of most, um, or a lot, not most, a lot of social psychology studies to replicate. And I needed to read that book. I needed to say what he was going to say about it. Um, so I... In that case, I actually got it from the li library rather than stealing it. Um, but I'm a big proponent of stealing media that you want to consume or study uh, where you don't feel, you know, good about supporting financially the person who created it. Bambi Girl asked, where do I get the patience um, to not put my ideas out there? It's really hard. Got to go be a therapist now. Oh, thank you for being here, B. Bailey B. And thanks for um, your patience with all of my tech issues. Um, I'm surprised this many people turned out with such late notice and with me having so many tech problems. So I'm just really thankful. Um, and we will figure this stuff out. Or I'll just buy a $1,000 laptop or some shit. God damn it. <laughs> but then I'll be able to run streams more consistently and maybe have a tip jar that works. So whatever. Um, what was I just talking about? Oh, yes. Um, having the, having the patience to sit on ideas. Oh, thank you so much for setting an alarm, Bambi girl. That's so sweet. Um, I, for me, um, a lot of times if I think an idea is really important and somebody else is gonna lay stake to that territory sooner rather than later, I think... I really do just try and get it out there. Um, the fact that I have books coming out does put a limit on how much I share, and it does give me a motivation to sit on, on, um, on an idea to make sure that I articulate it the best possible way that I can with the best research that I can. So a lot of times I do just tell myself, save this for the book, save this for the book, but claim this territory in the public eye so people know to expect the book. Um, 
So that's kind of what I do. If I've coined a term or I have an idea that I think is really going to need to be out there in the discourse, I really try to make some social media posts or make an essay where I'm kind of publicly staking claim over the territory and saying, hey, you know, not in the intellectual property sense of no one else can write about this, but in terms of I want people to associate this idea with me um, because I've got more to say on this. Um, someone asked if I like writing or if I just like having written. Um, that's a famous Dorothy Parker quote. I hate writing. I love having written. And um, I, when the writing is good, I love it. Um, when the writing is ready and it's, and it's going, it's a very pure, you know, flow state, creative experience for me. Laziness does not exist was like that. Um, reading the audiobook of uh, Unmasking Autism was like that, though that's not writing, right? That's performance. Um, some, like, passages... Usually the intro and the and the um, and the conclusion of every book that I've written so far um, has been really easy and pleasurable because those are the parts of the books where I'm really saying, here is the idea, here's the problem that I'm talking about, this is what the laziness lie is, this is what masked autism is, and here's some personal inroad to talking about why I care about this subject. Um, here's what systemic shame is in the new book that I'm working on. Those passages are like the big throat clearings. And then you're really just like hitting the biggest, most important concepts such that even if someone walks away, having not read the rest of the book, they know what's going on. Um, yeah. Where, where is Aotearoa? And I know I'm mangling that. But I'm curious. Small world. New Zealand. Oh, okay. Awesome. I'm surprised it works out for the for the time zone, but thanks for being here. That's rad. Um Yeah, so so those are the passages um that are easy for me to write because that's where you're really letting your balls hang out and really saying, this is my idea, this is what I'm doing, this is my kind of story and why I care about this, and here's why you as the reader should care, and let's do this shit. Um, and then as you get into the weeds, in um, into the research in the book, you have to think a lot more specific, precise, hard-to-answer questions about what information needs to be included and what information doesn't and how do you make it flow in the best possible way. And that shit sucks. <laughs> that shit is not fun because you can second-guess yourself forever with it. Whereas that big throat-clearing intro and conclusion element of writing is really fun to do if you're prepared and ready and you really stand by what you're saying. And thankfully with all three of my books, um, that's felt like the case that I know that what I'm trying to talk about is important and somebody needs to do it. And that's why I'm writing it because nobody has. Um, do I always have confidence in my execution once I get into the weeds? Of course not. The middle is the hardest part. The middle is where you just live and die um, and where things can drag. And that's something that my agent, Jenny, is always reminding me of, that readers want to feel smart. Readers want to feel like their pre-existing viewpoints are being validated. And, um, and readers want to finish a book and feel accomplished. So you don't want to write an overly long book that's hard to follow or seems only tangentially relevant where people walk away from it feeling bad or confused. Um, I'm starting to think about writing on identity, but it's so personal and I'm pretty scared putting myself out there so blatantly when it's a hard world out there. So this is something that's come up in prior streams, but I will, uh, in, in a different context, but I will bring it up again. The criticism you're so afraid of that happens online so rampantly it doesn't happen with books and podcasts and twitch streams even to the same extent that it happens to social media posts when i was first writing laziness does not exist i was reading through it constantly with the most kind of paranoid uh negative view of myself and how i'd be interpreted possible 
all I could think about was, will people pick apart me for using the word addict instead of, you know, some other way of referring to addictions based on whatever community a person belongs to? Um, will people say that I'm being, you know, depolitical um, by telling people that, um, that it's not your obligation as a living being to try and save the planet through activism? Like, everything that I said that was potentially controversial, I was so worried about being canceled for. And um, what I discovered was that the kind of people who really viciously criticize um, someone for saying the wrong thing, those people don't read full books. Um, they don't listen to full two-hour-long podcasts. They don't sit through three-hour-long streams unless you are uber famous, unless you're, you know, Shane Dawson, Jordan Peterson, Kanye West, Trisha Paytas, level famous. <laughs> what a weird pantheon I've just created. <laughs> Those are the people who every little misstep they ever make gets picked apart. Um, and they make a lot of them. Um, and it's become, you know, fodder for picking apart. Their, their existence is inspiration for picking apart, uh, often rightly so. But even me, um, someone who, I don't know, you know, adding things up, tens of thousands of people have heard of, maybe a maybe hundred thousand people have heard of, I don't know. Um, people don't obsess over me like that, you know, like... I don't even have a Kiwi Farms thread yet. <laughs> we'll see um, if when that happens. But <laughs> the, night, the nightmare blunt rotation, <laughs> the Bambi girl, <laughs> the Jordan Peterson, Shane Dawson, King Kanye West, Trisha Paytas, <laughs> um, Hassan <laughs> Piker. I don't know. You know, those are the kinds of people who they have thousands of people hanging on their every word, looking for flaws. Um, I'm backed up with literally half a decade of writing of pieces. Yeah, um, I struggle with that as someone who has a growing body of work. Like, it all comes down to, like, what is your elevator pitch for any idea that you're trying to convey? You know? Like, what is the most stripped-down, simplistic way to say it? In National Novel Writing Month, we talk a little bit about, um, snowball writing, um, which the idea is, like, you start with just your story in a single sentence. What is the one-sentence version of your story that you're writing? Okay, now what's the paragraph version of that? Now what's the page-long version of that? Now is what the, what's the chapter-long version of that story? And you just keep writing out and out and out until you have the full thing. Um, because if you can't give a one-sentence kind of summation of what you're trying to talk about... Um, it might not be refined enough yet in your mind or clarified yet enough in your mind that you know what the big points are that you absolutely have to convey. And that's certainly true with writing a book as well. Um, and before you write a book, if it's nonfiction, you have to sell a book proposal. And the book proposal is kind of that elevator pitch. You have a one page ish overview where you're saying, you know, I'm talking about the Protestant work ethic and people thinking they're lazy or whatever, or you're, or you're saying there's a whole population of autistic pe out th people out there who research is overlooked and whose experiences are erased, erased. And this book is about that, you know, um, you have to really think, you know, and, and, and one of the ways that you get there is by just talking about your project with a lot of people. Um, so to answer your question, Cassie, um, how do you hone and clarify to that level? Um, you have to really practice explaining what you're working on to people who are bored <laughs> already <laughs> or potentially are bored. Um, and I think as an educator, I've gotten a lot of experience doing that, um, which is maybe why it came a little bit more easily to me than, um, than some other people. But I think the only way to get better at it is by by doing it, um, just writing down, here's how I'm going to do this. <sighs> Loud notification. Thank you for being here, Tolstay Us. Um, do you set aside time to discuss and work on your writing? Yes. This is another thing um, that Paul Sylvia talks about in How to Write a Lot. And there is um, an essay that I've written on Medium as well called The Science-Backed Way to Write a Lot. Um, so if you just Google that, um, that's on Medium. 
Uh, but what Paul Sylvia talks about is um, a writer, you know, a lot of times as writers we say things like, oh, I wish I could spend more time writing or I really need to get around to writing more. Um, but as a teacher, as a professor, we never say, um, oh, I really should get back into teaching or, oh, I should really find some time for teaching. Um, the way that you get teaching done is you have a schedule, you know, with your university and with your students and it is a set aside time every week where you have to teach barring some illness or, or disaster you show up and you do the teaching during that set aside time and when it's not that set aside time you don't do the teaching um and um and you do it even when you don't feel like it and some days you're going to flop a little bit but you'll still have taught and it's consistency um, that really produces results. And Paul Sylvia, he is a creativity researcher. And so he really points to studies that he and others have conducted showing that if you, as a creative person, have a consistent schedule and a consistent practice where you're showing up, you know, four hours a week, you know, spread across two different days to work on making a painting, at the end of a year, you will have way more work done, you'll have way more paintings, and you will be happier with your paintings than if you only waited until when you were inspired or in the mood to paint. And some of those set-aside times are going to suck ass, and you're not going to feel like painting, and you're not going to make things that you like, and that is still really good practice. Um, and it still gets you st every step closer, you know, brush stroke by brush stroke, closer to making what it is you want to make, um, or developing your own style as a painter. And that is the same basic principle at work here with, um, with writing, that you set aside time to work on your writing, a consistent schedule if you can, if life allows, and you treat it with the same sanctity as you would, I have to go to class, or I have to teach a class, or I have to lead this meeting at work. Um, it is an appointment with uh, the most important person in your life, yourself. Um, autistic people live through that structure, but those with dynamic disability can't do that. Is there a way to have structure and flexibility around this? I think so. Um, I think what your capacity is going to be um, in terms of your spoons and what your schedule looks like might change week to week. So it might be that at some periods in your life, um, with a dynamic disability, you're saying, okay, I can work on creativity three hours a week and I'm going to find, I'm going to set aside that every week. I'm going to look at my calendar and say, where are those three hours? Um, and, oh, Hey, hello photo. Um, and you know, you can kind of do that. And then maybe during higher spoon times of your life, you can say have six hours a week and sometimes of your life, maybe it'll only be an hour a week. Um, Dev, the audience needs a hack their parents, teachers, and therapists haven't told us. Wow us. Haven't told them. Wow us, damn it. Well, unfortunately, Eric, uh, this is really the one. Like, this is the way that it happens. And there are huge barriers to finding and making that kind of time, right? Like, if you work um, retail with a really inconsistent schedule and you're on your feet and you're tired, it's going to be just – it just is harder for you to find time in your schedule and to even just go about the work of schedule making. Um, so if you find it harder to be creative when that's what you're up against, of course you, of course you are. It's not from a lack of effort on your part. It's not a failure on your part. Um, it's just uh, the nature of uh, of the beast. Um, and and acknowledging that and being gentle with yourself around that, um, I think is important because, you know, you can't. You can't compare yourself to someone like me who has a mostly work from home job with a lot of scheduling flexibility. And that's why I'm such a, a, a maniac that writes, you know, a book a year, but I'm stopping after this. I'm taking a break because it's ravaged me psychologically, even with the luxury of time that I have. Captain Awkward, internet person who I love, has also mentioned it and I trust her fully. Yes. Jen, uh, we actually have some mutual friends. I have not met uh, Captain Awkward in person, but uh, she lives not too far from me, and we have some friends in common, including the friend that I wrote uh, Laziness at. Do you have specific advice for people who have trauma blocks to their creative process and writing ability? Um, 
I mean, no. I, I think it's important for me to be honest about the fact that um, I am very arrogant and I have thought for a very long time since I was a teenager that I have ideas that matter and that more people need to hear them. And then I've just behaved as if that were the case. Um, and so it feels very disingenuous for me to just tell you, oh, you need to just keep trying putting your words out there until it becomes less terrifying. I think, you know, in terms of building distress tolerance, that ultimately is the answer for most people in that boat. But how do you get there? Um, you know, I, I don't want to act like it's easy or like I know all of the answers for you on that. I think um, often f you want to look at what's in the challenge zone for you. So are you, you know, like able to tell certain friends about creative projects that you're working on or share something with certain kind of safe feeling people who aren't criticizing you? Um, are there anonymous places online? Um where you can share little poems or snippets or works of art that you made that you haven't invested a lot of your identity in because it's just kind of a quick little drabble that you wrote or a quick little thing you threw together. And so uh, if it flops, it's not the end of the world. It's okay to just throw it out into, into the anonymous abyss. Um, as Bambi Girl mentions, create even when you feel distress, um, even if you destroy it. Um, the artist way is a cliche, but doing those morning pages that they kind of recommend, just writing for 15 minutes and then throwing out um, or not putting any stock in what you've created and just saying this is just for the sake of practice and for the sake of creation itself um, can help you slowly start to regulate some of that distress. Um, thanks for being here, Chubby Kumquat. The throw the paint at the wall type vibe in um, Laziness Does Not Exist. I also talk about this um, Penna Baker's expressive writing method, which is just you set a timer for 20 minutes and you write continuously for that full 20 minutes. You do not edit yourself. You don't delete anything. If you run out of things to say, you just keep repeating what you just said until you think of something new. And when you are done with that 20 minutes, you're not showing this writing to anyone. It's not for anyone else's benefit. It's for processing. So you can light it on fire. That's cathartic to you. Um, a lot of people who experience writer's block or have a lot of trauma around creation, they struggle really hard with filtering themselves really heavily and thinking they don't deserve to make something or that the ideas that they have don't deserve to be expressed. And so just shitting it out and knowing it's going to be shit um, and not in being invested in it being of any quality is often the first route. For me, the version of that that really helped me cut my teeth as a writer was uh, National Novel Writing Month, which is every November. I started doing NaNoWriMo in, um, in graduate school. And for NaNoWriMo, you write a 50,000-word novel in a month. And you do that by writing about 1,667 words per day. And so every day, um, and I was in grad school, so I was busy, busier at that time and had less freedom and control over my schedule than I do now. Um, NaNoWriMo. Well, I say Rye because it's writing, but, you know, whatever, whatever you want. I also say Vivance, so clearly I'm, I'm fucked. Uh, <laughs> clearly I say things in a fucked up way. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm very, uh, linguistic descriptivist. <coughs> <coughs> There's cinnamon in that coffee, and so it's giving me the cinnamon challenge right now. <coughs> um, so for me, in graduate school, I just started doing NaNoWriMo. Even if it was at the end of the day, after taking classes and having lab meetings, I would just sit down for an hour and I would write, you know, 1,600 of the world's shittiest words about all kinds of shit. It was very stream of consciousness, impressionistic, fictional writing um, that was very navel-gazing and self-indulgent. And uh, it wasn't necessarily good. You know, I've never published any of my NaNoWriMo novels because they sucked ass. Um, and some of them even, you know, because I was, I was working as a program evaluator at the jail, at the Cook County Jail at the time. So I was writing a lot about some of the stuff that I saw in jail and some of the people that I met and some of the drug counselors that I met at the jail. And um, I should not publish a novel about jail and drug addiction. It's just not my lane, <laughs> right? Um, and... It was still kind of an interesting experience of processing, you know, just some of the stuff I was learning about and grappling with as a psychologist who was slowly becoming an abolitionist at that time. 
Um, but it was not a great piece of writing. Um, and I wouldn't be the person with the relevant life experience to really write whatever the hell I thought that novel was. Um, but it was practice. It was um, an hour of writing plus every single day. It was 50,000 plus words and I did it three years in a row. And that helped me hone my voice because I was just writing so much and I was also getting more comfortable with writing badly. Um, and so that really helped me. Um, Malcolm Gladwell is a, is a charlatan, but um, 10,000 hours uh, to become an expert in any kind of work, that idea has an appeal for a reason. And um, even though 10,000 hours is kind of an arbitrary number, you do need, I think, thousands of hours of practice at something before you really have the fluency to to do it intuitively and to and to trust yourself and so a lot of times whether it's painting or making music or writing you just have to get the bad art out of your system before some of it starts getting good and unfortunately and maddeningly even when it is um good you won't necessarily feel that it's good yet um because you'll be holding yourself to really a really high standard. Um, there's another um, quote on creativity by um, Ira Glass that um, it used to be really popular on Tumblr. Um, and so some of y'all might have seen it. But basically, um, he says that you get into doing um, the arts, you get into being a creative type because you have been... that is so loud <laughs> thank you for following c-word the lassophile thanks for being here and anyway ira glass says um if you're making art it's because there's a lot of art that you love and you might have really good taste and so and you might have a lot of vision um and you're inspired by really good works of art and so you're going to always be comparing what you're making to your taste and to the things that inspire you and to the imaginary perfect version of the work that exists in your mind. Um, and so there's always going to be this disjoint um, and that is a reflection of your aspirations and your taste. Um, I think I hold myself to an impossible standard because the internet demands you reference and cite where your knowledge comes from. Most of my ideas are from lived experience and I worry it isn't valid. People love personal narratives, though. Like, um, you know, part of why um, Unmasking Autism happened is because I was writing about autism both in terms of citing research, but in terms of narrating it as my own experience. It wasn't dry academies. Um, as much as um, academic writing and scientific writing and, and claims of fact kind of do kind of demand being backed up with sources, um, People crave narratives. People want to hear individual stories. And you almost need a narrative to kind of trick people into accepting the facts and the citations anyway, if that's what you're setting out to do. And it doesn't sound like that is what you're setting out to do. So you shouldn't compare yourself to, you know, um, to writers that are working in a more um, citation-heavy mode. Um, you can only speak to your own experience, which means that... Um, you can make choices about how you frame your writing to make sure that you are just saying, this is, this is my experience. This is what I've learned. These are the patterns that have emerged in my life. And that doesn't have to be um, true of anyone else. You know, like you don't have to frame it as, and this is why, you know, everyone should see their life in this way or why, you know, these same dynamics play out the same for everyone. Um, on Twitter, and Tumblr, to a lesser extent, on social media, if you just share your personal experience, people will generalize from that anyway. Um, people will think you're making some big de declaration about human nature just by sharing something that you personally feel. But um, if you're doing writing, whether it's a medium essay or a substack or a book um, or a short story that has some, some element of personal voice in it um, or a piece for a magazine, it's okay to speak from your own experience. You'll just need to find the outlets that are looking for that kind of personal narrative uh, driven work. And the good thing is that readers love that. Um, readers find it a lot easier to relate to than things that are chock full of citations. And if all you're trying to do is describe your own experience, which that in and of itself has immense power and impact, um, a lot of the conclusions that I draw in 
my book are from reading tons of personal narratives um, and that autistic people had been posting online on their blogs and on social media for years. Um, and so that that is enough. You don't have to be a kind of citation, citation heavy writer. Um, there's definitely a place for all of it. Um, So I just saw a question about follow the dopamine type of writing versus having a consistent schedule. Um, let me scroll back down. I think QZ might be a bot. Um, oh, or or maybe or maybe someone who's just trying to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation in this public venue. But um, but we're uh, we're we're talking about writing and stuff like that right now. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that you're not a bot. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so to, to answer your question about dopamine-driven writing versus um, schedule-driven writing, uh, the muse is a myth. Yeah, yeah, Eric, I think I think you might need to, to use your, your powers. <laughs> Thank you. You can send me a question on my Tumblr ask box if, if you have one, but that'll be it. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, time out. That's a good... You're such a judicious uh, and fair mod, Eric. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone, uh, ham hammers in the chat for, for Eric's incredible work, uh, both roasting me and wielding the, the ban hammer. It's much appreciated. <laughs> and, and handsome, too. Yes. Uh, why not? <laughs> and and um and a man of taste. Oh man, why are my visuals glitching? Ooh. Um, okay, so so dopamine driven writing versus um schedule driven writing. The data to me is very, very clear on the fact that writing consistently on a consistent schedule, and it doesn't mean that it has to be the exact same time every week, but you know, having some consistency in how often you do it and really showing up even when you don't feel like it, barring emergencies, of course. Um, oh, and, and sorry, Bambi, for Nightbot telling you not to use emotes. Emotes are, emotes are beautiful. I will change Nightbot right after this to fix that um, error message. We're learning so much this, <laughs> this stream. <laughs> um, but Paul Sylvia goes into all of the data and research on this um, in his book, How to Write a Lot. And I also cite and talk about a lot of it in my um, piece on Medium called The Science Backed, the science -backed Way to Write a Lot, um, which you can read for free. <laughs> and um, what we find consistently is that even though writers and most creatives really want to believe in the romance of the muse, the way that you actually get the muse to visit you more often is by scheduling time to work on your shit and just doing it. Um, as I kind of shared, I wrote Laziness Does Not Exist at the essay at a, um, at a writing jam, you know, at a friend's house. And we had that scheduled every week. I was going to their house every Sunday and writing. And I produced a lot of work on those Sundays. And it was because I was there telling myself, I need to write today. What do I feel like writing about? That laziness came out of me. Um, it felt like magic and divine inspiration, but it was actually uh, years of thinking and talking about the topic and studying on it and a consistent writing schedule. Um, and, and the data really, really does bear this out, that people who wait to feel inspired write less, they feel inspired less often, they're less happy with their work, um, and they see creativity as this magical process outside of their own control. Whereas um, if people have a consistent uh, schedule for creativity. Um, you know, it's just like, it's just like working out. It's just like doing the laundry. It's, it's just like going to class. It, a lot of times it sucks, but it adds up. Um, and you can look back on, on the accumulated masses of it. And you are basically kind of scheduling dates with the muse every week. And sometimes she shows up, uh, and you guys have a good time together. And other times you're, you know, doing a lot of things that go into writing that need to get done, that are not the fun part. Um, and this is something, again, Paul Sylvia also talks about. when During your set-aside writing time, that includes things like outlining. 
That includes things like annotating notes and gathering references and organizing your references. Um, editing counts as writing. Everything that goes into the process of writing, you work on that stuff during your writing time. Um, that helps you get there. Um, and so you give yourself credit for that. It's not just typing out words that's writing. Um, research is writing, all of these things. Um, but you have to really, again, set aside time to consistently work on it and do it. Um, oh, now the chat's making a mess. <laughs> I'm doing laundry, going to the gym, a slew of things I suck at. Okay, so so... And that's real, right? Especially, again, ADHDers, spoonies, lots of people struggle with all of that shit. Um, and often what we need, a lot of us, Rem and Body, is some kind of social structure and impetus. Um, and with creativity, that is something where you can, you can find uh, kind of accountability buddies. And a lot of people really do thrive from having that accountability. Um, you know, here in Chicago, there's a wealth of different writing groups that people can join. Um you know, both paid ones and free ones that you can just kind of find on Medium and during NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, there are write-ins at cafes. Um, there's a regular writing group that meet uh, used to meet at um, at a Common Cup um, coffee shop. They've, they've moved since that place is closed, but there's writing groups that meet consistently and kind of if you do a little Googling around in your community, you might be able to find them. Um where people just consistently show up every week to work on their creative projects. And if those kinds of um, previously already existing kind of writing groups don't appeal to you or you can't find one, then you can find a writing buddy by just talking to, or another creativity buddy by just talking to other friends that you have who are creatives and saying basically, oh yeah, Rembody, there's lots, there's lots of writing groups in Chicago. Um, and I used to avail myself to a lot of them. I've become more of a hermit since the pandemic, but a lot of them are kind of up and up and going. Um, so I look, look for like National Novel Writing Month write-ins, look for writing groups on Facebook, believe it or not, meet up, just Googling around. Um, a lot, there's a lot of different, um, cafes and, and cafe bookstores and things like that so like check out like the bookseller check out like Kopi cafe eli's tea bar like there's there's stuff around um but you can also make one you know if you have one friend who is like oh damn i need to be working on my web comics more often you know let's you can just kind of say to them let's let's set aside every sunday afternoon let's meet at this cafe or let's meet at each other's houses or let's both get on a discord call together and play some music and just work on our projects together um, and hold one another accountable to working on it that is something that a lot of people find incredibly uh, motivating and yes as Gwyneth B uh, mentioned zoom groups QZI32 is my creativity buddy and you made me give them a timeout. <laughs> oh well they um they had a lot to say, which is, is great. That's half the battle. You know, they were not struggling with the self-censor. Um, and we should all be uh, so bold. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so those, those are things that people tend to report getting a lot of value out of. Um, and to me, it, you know, they did, um, even though I also tend to pull away from structured play like that because I get very easily distracted or annoyed by other people or like loud environments like cafes um, and people having fucking speakerphone conversations in them um, but if you can't um, kick your own ass into writing every day that is very normal um, and especially if you're an ADHD or having some kind of social element and obligation built into it can really help I'm glad that these uh, some of these tips are uh, are hitting home for people. I, I'm still so disappointed that I couldn't do the whole little PowerPoint presentation that I put together, but I'm glad um, that talking about it more informally is still kind of holding some people's attention and that we're getting a good combo out of it. Um, and all of this is to is to like say like this shit is hard. Um, I don't want to deny that it's hard. Um, or minimize it in any way, um, it's hard to find the time. Gwyneth B., don't force yourself to write about shit you don't care about. Yeah. 
Um, BMB, the PowerPoint is uh, intentionally janky. Um, it's like just, you know, courier new bullet points to kind of guide what I'm talking about, about like, here's the stages of selling a book. Um, so I'd love to still just give that little annotated talk at some point. Um, and so I think I might just save that for a future stream because, and I also do have an essay that I'm planning to have come out, um, about what for me, the book selling process looked like. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll queue up that post and then we'll have a little post-mortem stream where we talk about it. Um, and, you know, so this one ended up being more of an informal Q&A and convo, which works out fine. Um, the stages of selling a book. Yes, Marta. I, um, yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, that, and that's something that, like, I don't know. It, it was a very... Um, it was a process that I had to demystify for myself and have an agent walk me through. And even with her support, there were so many things that nobody told me. Um, and so breaking down how it works, I think is just something a lot of people need to, to need to know. Um, cause I certainly didn't know. So I'd like to still make that a formal stream at some point. How has my video quality been throughout, by the way, does it, it, on my end, it looks like it glitches sometimes or freezes for a minute, but it's like, tolerable basically also Marta you and I should also just like talk about that um privately at some point because I would love to send you example book proposals um and support you in getting something like that done and I've been telling Jesse that as well for probably a year plus now skip a little tough times for a second or two okay good I'm glad it's not freezing too much but yeah um I have also in the past posted my book proposals online um, in a Google Doc, um, and I'll do that again because I think that is internal and institutional knowledge that really needs to be brought out into the fore um, because the people who get closed out of publishing, it's generally marginalized people. It's generally people who don't have the um, generational wealth and whiteness kind of backing them up to make it possible to access that stuff. So. So sharing those resources can be really helpful. My old advisor has been pushing me to write a book and I'm needing to establish regular writing as a habit, it sounds like. I think that really is, unfortunately, the answer. Um, a book proposal um, is, yeah, it's kind of like a storyboard for the book. Um, I'm not sure if there are a bunch of things I need to do first before a book proposal. Marta, I would say basically writing the book proposal is, aside from just first having that kernel of an idea, um, the proposal is more or less where you want to start. Um, the, cause I, th I think especially in your case, Marta, because you already have, um, a social media presence out there, um, which unfortunately conventional publishers do care about a lot. I think, um, having a few essays or Substack articles to point to that are kind of similar to your newsletters that you send out, um, but introducing a few concepts like that would be good to link to um, as examples of your writing when you go about the process of um, querying agents and then trying to sell um, a book proposal to an editor at a publisher. Um, but I think Marta, in your case and in Jesse's case, in the case of people like that who who have done some who are known online and have their work ha has had a fingerprint um, online and and affected other people for the positive, um, you're starting out um, a little bit ahead of the game, which means that you just need to have a few little places to point to that are that are like here's proof of concept here's proof of what I do and my ideas in action and you can tell that I know how to write um, and then here's the idea for the book here's what I'm gonna make um, and and having a nice tight proposal will be what you use to reach out to um, to potential agents and then later you and your agent will reach out to an editor um, yeah yeah and and I would love to just like have a have a zoom or, or talk via email about this stuff because I really think um, I'm certain you have have a book in you if that's something you want to do um, and a lot of your ideas could be accumulated into something and for you I think you know talking about different routes of like small publisher versus large publisher versus artisanal um, I say this as someone who like the first few novels that I wrote I self-published first and um, you know it, it depends on the on exactly which project and you might even have multiple ideas that you want to germinate into different kinds of books um 
and different kinds of resources. Because I think um, I think a divergent design book is something you could definitely, you know, um, what's the baseball metaphor <laughs> for when it's good? <laughs> when you throw it and it's good. <laughs> I don't know. I'm too gay for that. But um, I think you have something that would be kind of uh, very easy to articulate to big publishers um, as something that a pretty wide um, kind of prescript- prescriptive nonfiction slash self-help audience would want to read. Let me take a sip of water. Knock it out of the park. <laughs> there's knock it out of a par- out of the park, but then there's one that's a pitching metaphor where it's like right down the center or something like that, where it's like you're really like you've set it up perfectly. That's what I have in mind. Like it's like about the delivery rather than the hitting. I don't know. Um, because because we're talking about pitching books. That's why I'm <laughs> where my brain is going. There's some kind of pitching that's good. <laughs> that I think it'd be very easy for you to pitch a book in a way that a publisher would say I get this and I see that I have a market for it oh well um so I saw there was a question I find it challenging to organize my work and ideas into something that flows collections of essays and prose Mm, yeah okay so rewinding back a little bit to talking about um book proposals and elements of a book proposal um and this is something in the that we'll get into that it'll make more sense with the with the PowerPoint. But to just give you a taste, um, and yes, Eric, in fiction you have to finish the book and then find an agent, but with nonfiction you just have the idea for the book and the proposal, and you sell the proposal. And after the proposal has sold and you got paid already a little bit, uh, then you write, which is what's so beautiful about nonfiction. And so in order to do that, you have to have your pitch, your, your proposal, and that usually consists of an overview, which is a couple of pages, and it's saying, here in the most strongest voice possible is why we need this book and what this book is going to be and why I am the motherfucker to write it. Then you have an outline um, of the book with sample paragraphs throughout, kind of articulating this chapter of the book is going to talk about this. It's going to include interviews with this these people. It's going to include a profile of this event or this example. Um, and it's going to touch on these themes. Um, and you do that for every kind of major section of the book. Um, so that might be a few dozen pages. You have your comparative titles, which um, that is where you list books that have already been published that were a financial success. And that's really important, that your book is supposedly going to be similar to. So even if you don't like the books, (laughs) you're going to have to pick books that were a financial success that are writing in the same kind of market as what you're writing. Um, And basically in the comparative title section, this is where you go, my book is going to be Bullshit Jobs meets Brene Brown. That's what how I would sell uh, Laziness Does Not Exist. Um, even if I don't like either of those authors. I actually do like David Graeber a lot. I love Bullshit Jobs. But, um, you know, you have to choose people who have been a financial success because you're trying to prove that your book is worth them investing in. Um, and, yeah, so, yeah, I'll get into money in a little bit here in a second um, vis-a-vis that. Um, and so you list, you know, four to five comparative titles that are books that are in a similar genre, similar subject matter that have been a success to kind of prove to the publisher that, and your agent potentially, that you're trying to write something that is saleable. So for laziness, it was books like You Are a Badass, um, Shop Craft, Craft as Soul Craft, Shop Craft as, Shop Class as Soul Craft. That's a book that's about like, I don't know. Like, it, it, it's a prescriptive nonfiction book that my agent picked that sold very well. Um, Brene Brown is fine. Um, I especially like her book that uh, is co-edited with Tarana Burke, You Are Your Best Thing, which is all about um, black shame um, and the shame of living under anti-blackness. That is Brene Brown's best work because she didn't write most of it. She just edited uh, and collected a bunch of essays from black writers talking about shame so that's where i would recommend people start i think she's fine um you know she's she's very pop psych she has some problems um especially in who she kind of 
positions herself as being for, but she's actually, she's, you know, she doesn't question fat phobia at all in her work. And so her books are just completely, it's really frustrating because she talks about shame, but then she doesn't question the fat phobic norms that lead to a lot of shame for fat people. So it's like, how can, you know, you know, it's too bad. She didn't, she doesn't go far enough to question the power structures that created shame. So even though she can talk about beauty culture and capitalism in certain ways, she doesn't do that with dieting, you know, anyway. Um, in addition to your comparative titles, you also need a marketing plan. This is the bubble burster for a lot of authors that a lot of people really struggle to accept. Um, you as the author are in charge of your marketing. Your publisher might help you a little bit by setting up some interviews, by making some assets you could post on your socials, um, which you may or may not want, um, by having some ideas for what you might want to do, but you market your book first and foremost. And they want to hear how many social media followers do you have, what kind of events will you organize to market your book, what are you going to do to get the word out. Um, and... If you can't articulate that, um, that's that'll be a big problem for you. Uh, unfortunately, that means people who have a lot of followers do tend to be more likely to get um, book deals. But that is not the only way. I did not have a lot of followers when laziness sold, but I did have a viral piece I could point to um, as evidence that I could reach a wide audience. And I had media connections, interviews I had given in the past. Um, I had written for Slate. I had been on WBEZ. I could point to those things. And so the more that you do those kinds of things, Marta, in your case, pointing to the live streams, pointing to the kind of um, supporter community that you already have, um, the followers you already have, um, your newsletter, all of those things, and providing those numbers of how many people follow them, those are all things you would want to do. And yes, Cassie, Brene Brown, what she's missing is critical theory of where, of all, where all these sources of shame come from. And that's why You Are Your Best Thing is a little bit better, because it does talk about anti-blackness in that way. Um, but it doesn't go far enough. But, um, but I would still recommend that book. I think that book has some good, some good nuggets in it. And I think shame resilience as a skill is a real thing. And a lot of what she talks about for how to build it and how practicing it looks is all true. Um, it just is frustrating sometimes. Um, Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, so yeah, so your marketing plan is another page of the book proposal-ish where you're saying, I'm going to talk to these media outlets. I'm going to massage these, you know, contacts that I have. Um, you would mention me, for example, Marta, as, as someone that you would use to help market your book um, and someone that would blurb your book, which obviously I would be very happy to do, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have a sample chapter, which could be, you know... 20, 30 pages, something like that, maybe 15 pages. Um, and then you link out to a couple of other example pieces of your writing, throw that all together, all together, your book proposal should be between 50 and 100 pages. Um, you want it to be something that an editor can read in a single sitting without getting bored. And you want them finishing reading the book proposal, just salivating and saying, damn it, I want to read this book. You've just given me this promise and I want to see you deliver on it. And I believe that we could also make some money from this motherfucker. So that's that's kind of how you want to kind of present it. And it can feel slimy. Uh, writing a marketing plan feels slimy. Writing comp titles feels slimy. But it's definitely like just how you kind of get the monies. And that brings us to the monies. And um, in, in uh, big five, like big publishing um so not academic presses but the big boys um what you do is you get paid an advance an advance is a is a lump sum um of money that uh is basically in advance of your sales so it's a reflection of how much they anticipate your sales to be how much they expect to profit off of your book one day um so that'll be related to um your marketing plan and if you're famous or if you've had books sell in the past and uh and racism and sexism and things like that as well um so this is where you'll want to look up the publishing paid me spreadsheet so if you just look up hashtag publishing paid me spreadsheet 
Um, there's a whole database collected of what a bunch of different authors have gotten paid as their advances, as well as their race, their sexual orientation, their gender, their genre, um, their publisher, all of these other things. So you can get a sense of how much to expect based on who you are and what genre you're operating in and what biases are baked into the industry based on that. Some people's book advances are $3,000. And that's all they get paid before writing the book, um, or a fraction of that. Some people's book advances are hundreds of thousands of dollars or a million dollars if they're famous. Um, most people, you know, it's somewhere in between, and it's usually going to be, if you're a first-time author, under six figures, um, you know. Um, and it's so dependent on, is your agent helping you negotiate? Because agented sales make tens and tens of thousands more money and for that an agent gets 15 percent um and um if you get multiple offers from multiple publishers based on the strength of your proposal then your book goes to auction which means they basically are fighting over how high your your advance is going to be um which is great because then you're going to get a bigger advance oh thank you maddie for linking to that thank you so much oh i wasn't sure if you were still here I, thanks for thanks for being here um so that's the publishing paid me spreadsheet, um, and and my um, my book's in there. Um, for anyone who's curious, um, I know laziness is is in there, um, and so with your advance, that is something that you basically after you get an offer from a publisher and you accept it from an editor, um, and you sign it and everything, you get twenty five percent of your advance at the time of contract signing. You get 25% when you deliver your manuscript, the full book, to your editor, and they say, yep, this is more or less what I asked for. It might need some tweaks, but this is, you wrote a book. You wrote the book you said you were going to write, and I'm pretty happy with it. Good job. You get the other 25% of your advance. Then you and your editor edit your book together for uh, a period of months, um, and uh, when your book comes out, you get another 25%. And then a year later, when the paperback copies come out, you get the final 25%. And that, um, your, again, your agent takes 15% out of each one of those. Um, and independent publishers will be uh, smaller advances, more on the three to five to $10,000 range. Um, but you'll have a lot more kind of editorial control and can be a little bit more specific and, and niche in what audience you're targeting, um, which is where you get places like Haymarket Books here in Chicago that does a lot of leftist publishing. And they, they put out a lot of great books, um, Saving Our Own Lives by Shira Hassan, which I've been talking about a lot lately and t um, talk about in the essay of mine that went live today about harm reduction um, and eating disorders. That book is from Haymarket. They're great. Um, Eric asked how, what determines what uh, editor you pick. So after you have written a proposal and you query agents, and querying is basically you email agents, you send them a sample proposal, and you send them an email saying, I would love to work with you because you write, uh, you work with nonfiction uh, um, authors who are writing in a similar space as me. Here's the idea for my book in one paragraph or less. <laughs> you know, Here's the proposal. If that paragraph interests you, come and work with me. If an agent chooses to work with you based on that querying process, you work on the proposal and edit it together, and then your agent takes your proposal to editors at different publishers and meets with them and schmoozes and asks them if they're interested to make an offer. If an editor wants to work with you on your book based on that proposal that they received from an agent, they go to their bosses and they say, here's the proposal. I want to work on this book. May I have some dollars, please? And their boss says, I'll give you, you know, $50,000 uh, to offer for this book. You know, here's my limit or 100000 whatever it is. 5000 depends on what the publisher will be. A bunch of different editors might all be doing that, asking their bosses for money to offer you to work on your book. They come to your agent and they say, whatever they have to offer. I have, you know, $10,000 to offer for this book. I have $50,000 to offer for this book. And it becomes an auction. It becomes a bake-off um, if multiple editors are interested in your book. Um, and your agent fields all of these offers and tells you what's kind of coming in, saying, okay, you got an offer from Simon & Schuster for $25,000, and you got an offer from Hachette for $30,000. 
and here are the two different editors, um, and here are the books they've worked on in the past. Um, we should take the offer that's for more money, the $30,000 offer, but if you really love the $25,000 editor, we can go back to them and ask them uh, if they can maybe sweeten the deal. So you talk through all this stuff with your editor. You talk about this publisher has has these kinds of resources. This this publisher has this editor, and I really like this editor based on the phone call that I had with them. There's a million different variables to talk about, um, and that's what an agent kind of helps you work through, deciding who do I want to work with based on who offered the most money and who has the most resources. Your agent, uh, your agent works for you, and they take fifteen percent of your advance. You do not pay them directly. They only get paid when you have sold a book. Um, but they take a big hefty chunk. But the um, upside of that is that they negotiate for you. And, um, and and the data does actually bear out that it, as long as they're not a scammer, if they're an agent with a reputable agency, um, it's called Publishing Paid Me, Marta. Um, and Test Device, um, that's Maddie, uh, my co-host and producer, she um, linked to uh, that spreadsheet. So it's like a Google Doc link um, farther up in the chat. Um, and I can send it to you as well. Um, but if you search Publishing Paid Me spreadsheet, it'll pop up, and it's a Google Drive on Google as well. Um, as long as you're working with a reputable agent at a reputable agency and you want to vet this by researching them, checking out their website, interviewing them, asking them about who they've worked out in the past and verifying that it's true, um, once you have an agent, they will negotiate these things for you with editors and um, their incentive for doing that is the more money you get offered from a publisher, the more their 15% bite is going to be. And, um, and agented sales really do make a lot more money. Um, I would have not have any of the book deals that I've had um, or maybe any books at all if not for my agent. So um, as long as it's a reputable agent and you get good vibes from them and you're on the same page with regard to what your goals are, Having an agent, in my view, um, if you're going for a big publisher in the big five, um, that's going to be better for you. And, and the contract, there's just, there's a lot <laughs> to go through. Yes, shout out to my agent, Jenny. Um, and I won't uh, put her on blast because I don't want her getting, um, she's not accepting new clients right now. So I can't, I don't want to put her on blast where she's getting any queries from anyone because she has a novel coming out of her own that she wrote in January and she has kids. She's new, new babies. She's taking care of. She has a whole life going on. Um, and so, uh, you know, she's not taking on new, uh, authors at this time. Um, but she's changed my life, um, completely. And I wouldn't have had these good, decent book deals either without her. So God bless Jenny. Um, so yeah, so generally speaking, in terms of what determines um, what book deal you take, you usually have to take, if, it's, if you get an offer that's higher in terms of money by tens and tens of thousands of dollars, you have to go with the higher offer at auction. But if it's in a wiggle room of like a few thousand dollars, you can say, hey, listen, I would love to work with you. I like your editorial style. I like the other authors you've worked with in the past based on the phone call that we had together because you have phone calls with all potential editors that are interested. You know, I like you and I want to work with you. However, this other editor, this other publisher has made an offer that's greater. Can you go back to your boss and see if you can get some more money because I would really love to work with you. And this is something that's all communicated through your, um, through your agent, not through you directly. You're not supposed to contact or talk to your editor until you sign a contract with them. Um, because there's lots of like shady stuff that could happen in the background if you um, if you didn't do it like above board from the publisher and the agent's point of view. Um, so you negotiate all this shit. It takes months. Um, you eventually get an offer that you agree to if you're lucky. Sometimes that doesn't happen. But if you're lucky, you get an offer from an editor that you want to work with and it's an amount of money that you can live with. And then it's time to refine all the details of the contract, which takes months. <laughs> um, and and you don't hear anything for kind of a long time and so even though you've just been offered a book deal and maybe been offered thousands of dollars or whatever you're kind of just waiting for a second there and during that time your agent and your publisher fight over things like are you going to get 
25 or are you going to get 12% um, of sales after your book earns out its advance or are you going to get 10%? Is the book going to have a hardcover release or is it going to have a paperback release first? Is it, are you going to narrate the audio book or are they going to find an actor to do it? Um, all of these things. Um, are you distributing, like what's the distribution look like? What, how many copies are they going to print? All of these things that you might not even give a shit about or you won't know how to make these decisions, like what you're supposed to want. And that's kind of what an agent is there to help you decide. And you can negotiate all that shit. You get a contract. Months later, you sign it. And after you've signed it, you get the first 25% of your advance. And then you start writing and you can talk to your editor. Uh, C-N-J-H-C. Is there a good reason not to write the nonfiction book itself before the proposal? Yes. Um, people might not want the book that you want to write. You might need to change the entire outline, the entire structure. You might need to add chapters. You might need to change um, everything about it practically. You don't want to write the book first um, because you might just have to write it all over again anyway. Um, and the evidence of that is that all three of my books, the proposal and the final product, are almost nothing alike, um, especially Unmasking Autism. Um, Unmasking Autism was, was originally going to be a memoir, um, which is, and now it's prescriptive science, self-help, whatever you want to call it, with a personal narrative infused throughout it. Um, Laziness Does Not Exist was going to be called You Are Not Lazy, and it had a completely different structure, and it had a completely different editor. My editor left part partway through the process. Everything about it changed. That first editor said that it was too political and was going to like try and like radically change my writing in it, and then she left. Um, and then the book that I'm writing now, um, the proposal, I worked on it with my agent for like a year before it went to, to sale. Um, and a lot, a lot changed about it. Everything about how it was organized. Um, and what um, sells has a lot to do with the market and current trends and what editors are interested in and what has come out that has sold or failed in the years since you first had your idea. I had to completely change the title and concept behind my current book because there is a similar book that came out um, that wasn't actually all that similar, but it had a similar title and it flopped. And so I needed to completely like redo a lot of how I presented this book that I'm working on because editors were scared and publishers were scared that it would similarly flop because it sounded like a book that had flopped, even though it wasn't really the same. Um, it was originally going to be called The Shame Economy and there was a book called The Shame Machine that came out and did not sell very well. And so I had to change I had to change it pretty dramatically and I'm glad that I did because I think systemic shame makes more sense than the shame economy. But, um, you know, it takes a while to get an idea right where it needs to be. Um, so for nonfiction, you really don't want to want to write the whole book before you try and sell it because it might be that the book that you have to write is not something that people want to buy. And with their insight and the economic pressures, you might write something completely different in the long run. And, um, Sometimes that's a good thing. I'm glad unmasking autism is unmasking autism instead of being a memoir. Um, you know, so I'm glad that I was subjected to those external forces that delayed publication of that book by like two years. Um, cause I originally got an offer on it in 2019. Um, I don't have a date yet on the shame book, uh, Marta. Uh, and that is because my, um, editor has been on leave. Um, Everybody's been on leave lately. Um, she just got back, so I'm going to send her the first full draft of it tomorrow, um, which I'm very stressed about. Um, and so we'll start having a sense of the timeline once she gets a look under the hood and has a sense of how much work it needs because she hasn't seen it. Um, she's only seen the proposal and seen, you know, and then she went on leave. And so then I've just been writing 96,000 words and crying every day. Um, since then, so hopefully next year, that's my hope is late next year. I would be bummed if it didn't came out, come out next year, but, um, but my editor, um, Michelle is, is really great and she makes my work better. So it'll be worth it. Oh, thank you. You know, when I, when I was at this stage of unmasking autism, I thought it sucked and I had to make some pretty significant changes. Um, 
and it ended up being good. So this is just how it goes. Creativity is a fuck. 99,000 dead authors, <laughs> whatever. Born, born to write, the world... Born to write, publishing is a fuck. 99,000 dead authors. It will be crushed in a good way. Thank you. It will be crushed or I will be crushed. Has unmasking autism done well? It really has. Um, and this is where we can talk about numbers too. So I already talked about advances, which is the payment you get paid for writing the book. Um, and if your book does not make enough money to um, defray the cost of that advance, you never get any royalties. So um, this is called earning out. So let's say that your publisher gave you an advance of $20,000. If your book does not profit $20,000, you're never getting any royalties. And unfortunately, that's the majority of authors. Um, in 2020, uh, was it 95 or 98 percent? I think it was 98 percent of all books sold fewer than 5,000 copies. Um, so the vast majority of books that came out that year, and that was a good book sales year. A lot of people were reading books in 2020 and, and have been in the years since. It's, it's actually a good time for publishing. Uh, no, you do not have to pay anything back. An advance is like a loan that you don't pay back. That's the, that's the kind of weird thing. It's basically um, your publisher investing in you because they think that you're going to write something that they're going to make money on. And so they are betting on you by paying you kind of um, a salary for the time that you're working on it. And if your book does not make money, they lose. Uh, and it'll be far less likely for you to sell a book again in the future. Um, and that is the majority of authors. The majority of authors don't earn out. The majority of books do not turn a profit. Um, so when you look at it under that light, it makes a little bit more sense why authors get such meager advances. Um, that's because most books don't turn a profit. Um, neither of my books have earned out yet, and both of my books have been successes, which is wild. Um, so if you sell more than 5,000 copies in a year, your book is in like the top, you know, like five percentile, two percentile, like it's like, or in the top 98th percentile, sorry. Um, it's like one of the best performing books released in its year if you sell more than 5,000 copies. Laziness um, has sold 25, like 30,000 copies. I don't know. It's like in the, it's creeping up on 30,000 copies and Unmasking Autism has sold 34, 33, 34,000 copies already. Um, so that gives you a sense of the scale. Laziness was a success. Unmasking autism is far and away more of a success. Um, it's um, it's doing numbies. Um, and to give you a sense of what that looks like, laziness sells 200 copies a week pretty consistently every week. Um, its best sales week was the first week it came out when it sold 800 copies that week, that first week, because of pre-orders and stuff like that. Um, unmasking sells about 2,000 a week. So unmasking is like you know, 10 times better, uh, right? Then, uh, or it's an order of magnitude better than, uh, laziness and laziness was a success. Hello. Welcome back. I'm really thankful that unmasking autism isn't considered too niche. I think its specificity is why it was such a success. Um, publishers are very conservative. Usually they want to reach something that is like very populist and will reach a really wide audience. But that just makes a lot of books really generic and weak. Um, oh, thank you so much. I mean, thank you everyone that's like read it and supported it in any way. It's just, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more happy with how it's, um, how it's shook out. Um, and it has that thing that like publishers love, which is like organic reach which means I don't have to promote it to for it to sell people like it and then they buy it for other people which um is crazy um and that's why it's um its sales have like gone up over time rather than going down um and it had a big tiktok bounce ever since it blew up on tiktok it's been selling like 2,000 a week um pretty consistently um which is amazing um and once you hit a certain level of traction it kind of keeps going and so thank you everyone for being, I don't know, for making it possible. Like, cause at, at some point I, um, I kind of stopped having to market it, which is amazing. Um, and that's, I think the sign of a good idea, like laziness, the essay, especially I didn't have to promote it. 
it was just something that people wanted, you know, it was an idea whose time had come. Um, so, you know, that's, that, that's how that shook out. Um, so both of my books are going to earn out. They are going to, you know, go into the black instead of being in the red where, um, the num the profit up off of sales is greater than, um, the cost of my advance. And that means that then I will start earning 12.5% off of every sale, um, which are my, you know, my royalties. Um, I don't know exactly when that'll happen. Um, I don't really understand the math. I've tried doing back of the envelope cal calculations and it's kind of hard to figure out. I think it's like after, I, and it depends on how much um, my publisher profits off of each book so you know hard copies are more expensive than ebooks right um but once they hit a certain amount of profit i'll start getting to you know eat the drippings off of that um and suck off of that teat which is also my own teat because it's my intellectual like work but whatever <laughs> yes dyscalculia gang dyscalculia gang calculia I, I still don't know how to pronounce that isn't that bad um <laughs> The numbers are also just very, like, mystical and confusing. <laughs> New kink unlocked for dyscalculia? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Bambi, I'm sorry that, uh, that Nightbot just bonked you. I need to turn off all this shit. Nightbot is way overzealous. All caps and, uh, and emojis are all fine. <laughs> God. It's been such a struggle stream. <laughs> oh, oh, you're bratting the, uh, the moderator. That's good. <laughs> God. Your own teats of profits. Yes. I am, I am my own, uh, cow that I'm feeding off of. Oh, oh, thank, I mean, we persevered. I'm, I'm very thankful that we still had um, good conversations, even though uh, the tech limitations are so severe on my end. And I'm going to just, like, amass monies for a better device at this point because I have so much fun doing this stuff, and I have so many ambitions for these streams, but my tech is so shitty. Uh, ACAB includes Nightbot. Um, okay, so intellectual property and uh, book proposals. Um, can you... Um, are, are you asking, like, is a book proposal intellectual property? Um, I'm not sure what your question is there. Does ACAB include me? Oh, shit. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, you're definitely the judge. You might not be a cop, but you're definitely delivering sentences here. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure... Um, why you're asking it like in terms of like are you worried about like protecting the intellectual property because it's all just like um because i honestly don't i mean i never like uh copyrighted it like you don't really copyright it um you know because it's not like um it's not copyrighted like material it's like usually just a it's so you don't you don't post it anywhere like publicly so you only just email it to um your agent and then your agent emails it to editors so the only reason it would like get out is if it leaked um and that happens to people like milo yiannopoulos because people at simon and schuster were mad that a, a racist transphobe like him had a book deal and so they leaked his his shit um to shame him which is great because his book sucked ass and dick um but um Generally speaking, a book proposal is a Word document that you and your agent and editors are emailing around, um, and nobody sees it. I share it because my books are already out there. Like, who gives a fuck? Like, you know, um, the ideas are out there. Um, but um, generally, it's not going to get scooped unless there's some real, like, like it could happen. Like, there's some, some like, publishing intern could, like, send it to someone else, and, and then someone could, like, steal your idea, I guess. But, like the concept of a book isn't copyrightable anyway. Like there's a lot of books. Um, and this is why laziness didn't sell better by the time laziness came out. 
there were a lot of anti-productivity books. There was Jenny O'Dell's How to Do Nothing. Or no, there was um, her uh, Resisting the Attention Economy. There was Celeste Headley's How to Do Nothing. There was a there was Digital Minimalism, Minimalism by Cal Newport. Like Between the time that I wrote the essay, Laziness Does Not Exist, and by the time the book came out, lots of people wrote similar books because it was an idea who, whose time had come, you know? Um, our idea is intellectual property. Uh, no, you know, um, like multiple people can write about the same idea. Um, and I'm actually philosophically against the idea of intellectual property, right? Like, um, everything that I've written is a culmination of the work of thousands or millions of other people that came before me, you know, like laziness does not exist owes a lot to in praise of idleness by Bertrand Russell, right? Like the same ideas get explored in writing many times over. Um, and part of what gets a book sold is the fact that there were successful books in the past that explored similar topics. Um, so, you know, people could say if they wanted that my book is an improvement upon um, Divergent Mind or an expansion upon Divergent Mind and Asper Girls and Neurotribes and We're Not Broken and all of these things, you know, like there's lots of books that touch on similar things. Um, so the, the idea behind a book is not patentable. It's not copyrightable. Um, and it is something that you will often get scooped on. And that was maddening for me with laziness because I had the essay out first, but books came out before mine um, that were about similar topics. And some of them probably did probably sold better and it sucks, but all you can do is kind of write <laughs> as fast as you can as, and as best as you can. And sometimes other people will, will tackle a topic first, but that doesn't mean there isn't room for you to tackle on it, tackle it in your own way. Um, academia is not a fan of that idea. My supervisors have been very protective of my work and won't, won't let me share it outside of peer review. Yeah. Uh, academia thrives on gatekeeping. Um, the more um, positive view of that perspective is that um, ideas and, and evidence should be really carefully vetted by professionals um, so that people can't claim to have found, let's say, a medical treatment that works when it hasn't been reviewed and tested for safety and the data hasn't been reviewed, right? There are some reasons why vetting scientific information uh, maybe serves the public interest, but uh, gatekeeping also makes it harder for anyone to access information and build upon it or put it into use in their own life, and that is a big problem. Um, so there, there's a big difference between how academia looks at this and how mainstream publishing looks at this. None of my work would get would stand up to peer review because it's not it's not a journal article. It doesn't exist to serve that function. Um, and academic publishing is so slow and tentative, um, and, and their standards of evidence are so um, rigorous and slow-moving such that even if thousands or millions of marginalized people are saying something is happening, if it isn't already in a journal article, you can't really say in a journal article that it's happening. Um, and, um, and that's part of why I'm so driven to the to write in the mode that I write in. It's because it's really hard for any kind of anti-establishment um, like epistemology to like break through in academia. I don't need to be peer reviewed. Yeah. I also have um, a piece about how peer review is, is not objective. It's not scientific. The fact that two or three motherfuckers with PhDs have read your work and approved it is not actually proof of its rigor always. Um, do I think peer review exists for some valid reasons? Absolutely. And again, in the context of medical research, therapeutic modalities being tested, I understand why we want to vet those things and have some standards of evidence, right? Um, but the way it currently works, especially in psychology, is such that um, it it's not actually a very objective process at all. And it's very hard for any um, information that challenges the status quo to get through. Um, and that includes um, the status quo in terms of power, not just in terms of what the prevailing understanding of the evidence is. I work in trans health, so it's good we are peer reviewing our own work. Yeah, yeah, um, I think 
basically a lot of um, academic research needs like a peer review uh, sensitivity reader kind of process because a lot of times a lot of work gets published on queer people that hasn't been read or written by any queer scholars. And in fact, um, having lived experience is seen as a source of bias in the academy, which is just absurd. If you study a topic that's relevant to your own life, you're accused of taking part in me search. Uh, and they, they say you can't possibly be objective because you're invested emotionally in it. And that's, it's, it's just wrong, you know. Um, so there's, there's really big differences in how academia looks at this stuff versus how um, mainstream publishing looks at this stuff. And that's, you know, that, that means there's a lot of bad, untrustworthy books out there. You should not believe something that you read just because it's in a book. Like, there's a lot of unvetted shit that gets published. Um, you know, like, and not just the clear cases of fraud and lying, like your, you know, million little pieces memoir kind of stuff. But... Um, you also do get things that move at a little bit of a faster pace um, than academic publishing, though it's still pretty slow. And of course, the internet is much faster with all of the same problems that come with that. So, oh, and don't worry about taking over the chat. People be, be people being active in here is good. I'm off to mind map and Instagram post. Oh, that sounds great. I think I'm, I think I'm going to wind down as well. Um, we've been going at this for a couple of hours and, and fielded some, um, some real tech, uh, issues that have emotionally ravaged me because I'm very, uh, weak and, and, uh, fragile. So maybe we'll end on the 30 minute mark. So we'll, spend a couple more minutes answering any questions, any kind of short questions people have to toss over the plate, again, stumbling through baseball metaphors that I don't understand. Had some thoughts, banned some bots, met some thoughts. Oh, thank you, it's Farrar. I feel like such a like slob and like a, a dipshit for not being able to understand this stuff, but... Thank you so much, Devin. It's really great to see other trans academics and hear about how it's not just academia. There's a wide world out there beyond academia. Ac academia does not know what they're doing, and they don't know how to reach a lot of readers, right? They are designed in every way to make it hard for anyone to ever read anything you write in academia, and that's another reason why I left it. I like when the numby goes up. I like when people read the stuff that I write, and and even more so when it actually means something positive to them, you know? And... Um, and that means less gatekeeping, more accessible writing, more current writing, taking in uh, a really expanded uh, sense of what counts as a reputable source or a source that you can at least do make, you know, make some use of, you know. Um, <laughs> I should feel like a dipshit for so many other reasons. Yes. <laughs> well, part of me, I'm like, well, if I wasn't such a, such a cheapskate and I wasn't using a work laptop, then my tech would work. But it was a new laptop when I got it in 2020. But I know laptops are not really built for streaming. There was such a great thread in Divergent Design Studios about how much unmasking autism is helping folks. Oh, I'm really glad to hear that. And we'll have to like do another stream sometime in the new year because there was so much we didn't get a chance to talk about yet um, that we kind of anticipated talking about for, for your um, YouTube channel. And that was... That was really fun. Looking forward to listening to this recording. As many have said, I really appreciate the craft and dedication to taking things out of the ivory tower. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I, you know, I couldn't help but do it, you know? Like, this is so much more rewarding than, than academia. And honestly, like, the, the thing that, like, is just so wild is that, like, the, the critical thought and analysis from like every from like just a wider array of people is so much better quality than what academia can do. Like my ideas were only ever critiqued in the most like bland neoliberal way or sometimes just straight up conservative way when I was in academia or when my ideas were only getting processed in academia. So
any other last lingering questions, things to share about writing, publishing, creative process, etc. And we'll have a, a more organized stream on this topic sometime in the future. Y'all cover your ears. <laughs> I'm going to follow. Okay. <laughs> follow, follow warning. <laughs> Thank you, Cassie. Oh, God. The sound effect is delayed for me. But I see the animation. Oh, weird. I didn't hear it this time. Despite all the difficulties, it sounds like you'd still recommend it. Uh, writing? <laughs> I don't know. I hate it sometimes. I'm so burned out because I've been writing too much the last few years. Oh, thanks for hanging out, V-Bunnies. I'm glad it was still um, entertaining for you. Uh, trying to get published? I mean, I think going into publishing with clear eyes over how long it's going to take, and I think having a mix of I'm writing short things that I'm po posting online or sending to magazines and like getting that kind of shorter term gratification and audience response while having this long term project that I'm whittling away at. I think that is kind of very, it's very fulfilling. Um, I've made like decent money from writing now from getting a book deal because I had an agent and because I had a lot of good fortune and, and like, um, and and had, you know, like that, that uh, social media presence. So that helped tip it more in the scale of being worth all of the work um, for me. And that's, that's harder if you don't have as big of a like social media following and, and those things haven't come for you yet. Um, and so the calculus can change, you know, prior to, to having that kind of social media following, I, I liked self-publishing on, on Kindle um, better, you know, for my fiction. Um, that was that was a lot of fun. That was great. Um, I could have never done this without the support of an agent. It would have just been way too grueling and too confusing to understand. But um, so so much has come out of the the books that never would have come out of it if I was just writing the stuff online and self publishing it. I had I needed the help of a good editor. I needed um, in this case I in the in the case of unmasking autism I actually did have good marketing and promotion support and that really helped the book reach more people. It helped. Um, open doors for just having more people to talk to and interview for the book um, and to meet and um, and just getting more of a media response and and critique and people reacting to it so like I, I'm, I'm definitely glad I did it do you think making video essays is also good or is it better to get shorter written pieces out there I think if you're trying to get a book deal you'll probably have to do both um, I think video essays are great because they they can do so much bigger numbers. Like it's just a really big following that a lot of people get. Um, but I think most editors will want to know that you can write um, beyond just what they read, no matter how good the book proposal is, they'll want to see examples of your writing. Um, so you both need to have kind of some kind of social media reach that's kind of shiny and impressive so they feel like you can advertise the book and I think video essays and having a good YouTube following or, or whatever, Instagram, whatever, um, is beneficial to that. Um, but they also want, um, if you're not like a celebrity uh, who's going to have a co-writer or a ghostwriter working with you on the book, then you, you'll have to also kind of um, prove your writing chops. Um, and I know when I was sending out... Um, the proposal for laziness they wanted to see as many examples of publications i had as they could find because they really wanted evidence of you know is this flash in the pan or can this person write um in a lot of different modes and have, have they consistently been able to write a lot but after you've done a book then it gets easier because then because then they know that you're going to actually finish it because a lot that's the other piece of this this whole story that is that sometimes people get book deals and they never finish the book um, or they take way longer than anticipated so, oh, and that's a really good idea in terms of um, in terms of double dipping uh, and streamlining your process. Make an essay into a video, make a video script into an essay. Add a few extra, you know, stock photos or like actual art uh, links and citations. You know, some 
some headlines or, or you know outlining um, to kind of make it more reader friendly and and you can kind of churn it like that um, and promote them both. And I think that's actually, I mean, that's something that I'd like to see a lot more YouTube video essayists do because a lot of them, especially if I want to cite their work, I end up just having to rip a transcript of their videos using some weird like website, um, like downsub.com, which is for downloading subtitles <laughs> um, from video, YouTube videos. Um, so I wish a lot of these, I wish, you know, ContraPoints would put her stuff in an essay. Or, you know, whoever else. Sarah Zed. All right. Well, I think that's it for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, hopefully we'll be back at it soon. Um, we're still kind of figuring things out in terms of, like, scheduling and just kind of taking it by ear so far. But I think we're starting to more and more hit our groove of how to make this stuff work. Uh, and make it work. Thanks for thanks for being here, everyone, and thanks for bearing with my tech issues and being patient. I really appreciate it and being so encouraging. Kia ora to the other folks in New Zealand. Thank you for being here, Cassie. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Eric, for wielding the band hammer with um, with a plum. I'm glad you're starting to feel better, Maddie. I hope your spouse is doing okay with the bug that's going around. Share, follow, subscribe, clip, etc. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.